If you like the video make sure to like, subscribe, and comment. For more videos like this, long distance drivers, truckers, and people who drive overnight on rural and back roads. What's the scariest, unexplained thing, creature, alien, etc., you've seen on the roads? Not long ago, I was talking to one of my father's old friends, and he told me about an encounter they had decades ago. They're both in their 60s now, but they went to high school together in the early 1970s. He told me they went searching for some sort of mysterious phenomenon that supposedly occurs on a then uninhabited road. They had heard rumors about ghost lights in the area, so they decided to check it out themselves. He, my dad, and another of their friends were driving down the road in the middle of the night. This is a long road with no houses and no intersections, or at least that's how it was back then. At some point, they saw what appeared to be a single headlight, similar to a motorcycle, directly in front of them. He accelerated, trying to catch up to it but it maintained its distance. Eventually, he was accelerating at full throttle, and he was driving a mid-60s GTO at the time, but they still couldn't catch up to the light. Then it just suddenly disappeared without a trace. The next time I spoke to my dad, I asked him if he remembered chasing a mysterious light with his old high school friend, and he repeated the exact same story. It piqued my curiosity, so I did some research on it. Apparently, what they saw is known as the Suffolk Light. It randomly appears in front of lone motorists late at night, roughly halfway down Jackson Road in Suffolk, Virginia, which at the time was part of Nansaman County. Since it was first reported in 1951, it's been seen sporadically over the following decades. One day, I'm going to have to check it out for myself. Growing up on a farm in rural Iowa, I encountered many strange things. This story in particular is always the first one I tell. The farm I lived on was in an area surrounded by gravel roads, I would drive down one, Lilac Avenue, to town and back without seeing anyone else, save for the occasional truck or tractor. One dark, early winter morning, as I was driving to school, I came up and over a hill to see some sort of amorphous blob swirling in the middle of the road. I slowed to a stop only to find a few feet before me three or four huge black dogs encircling this scraggly, wild-haired, hunched-over woman. The dogs paid me no attention, but the woman stood straight up, if you could call it straight, turned around and stared directly at me through the headlights. I could tell where she was looking because, although she wasn't wearing glasses, her wide eyes were gleaming and reflective like a cat's. My heart was racing, and I didn't feel like I should get any closer to her, but I had to go. I slowly started to go around her when she lurched at my car and hit my hood with her hands. I floored it and sped away as fast as the gravel would let me. I'm not the only one who has seen her, either. My sisters were driving home one night, and they saw the same anomaly I had. My cousins were riding their horses down that road one day when they saw a crazy-looking woman walking down the road away from them. She walked into an abandoned house, they said, and when they tried to ride their horses by, the animals wouldn't move, and they started to act up. Eventually, they just had to turn around because the horses were too spooked to go any further. So I was driving down Fort Irwin Road again. This time it was pretty late, around 11 twelfths. I kept seeing these tall white things sort of like legs on the side of the road, and I was looking at one of the signs that says stay alert, stay alive, and I watched it poke its head out from behind it. My headlights hit his eyes, these big black vacant eyes, its fingers long and slender, peering over the sign as if to tell me I was next, that gaping mouth screaming, screeching at my car. I sped off, only for this thing to follow me along with its friends on the other side of the road. No matter how fast I went, they were right behind me. Lucky for them, a car headed in the opposite direction made them stop following me, but I'm pretty sure they found me. Not my experience, but my mom, when she was in high school, and her friends were driving around an abandoned church, and the daughters of the pastor had died of some disease and were buried there. When they were driving down the old abandoned property, a black cat crossed their path, and then they saw a dead-end sign, but the end was covered by a shadow, and it just said dead. After a few minutes, they all look out the window and see a ten-foot-tall hooded figure approaching the car. They floored it, but the wheels were spinning, and it eventually moved before it got to them. I don't know what this is, but if anyone has an idea, let me know. This happened to my dad back in the 90s. We lived in a small rural subdivision, about 4 miles from the edge of town. My dad drove the same back roads to work every day. Along these roads were dairies, feedlots, pastures, houses that sat on some acerage, fields used for agriculture, and hop yards. Driving home, he would pass the feedlots and houses first, and then some fields. Before he reached the stop sign where he would turn, the road had hop yards on either side. Dad often worked very late, coming home around 10. This laid out there, 
it would be rare to see any other vehicles. Maybe one or two others. As he approached the fields and hop yards, he noticed a round spotlight shine down on the road just a few yards in front of his pickup truck, just beyond his headlight range. It kept pace in front of him, never getting further or closer. At first, he thought it was a search light from a helicopter. He thought maybe the police were looking for someone. However, none of the local towns were larger than 10,000 people, and none of them had helicopters. Then he thought it was a private helicopter because there are at least two small municipal airports nearby. But that seemed rare, as we lived and worked near these airports and had never seen any helicopters in the area other than the medical transport that went to the nearest larger town 45 miles away or the military choppers with the double propellers that flew over so fast on the way north to the military base that was a couple hours away. As he reached the stop sign, he put his pickup in the park and started looking around to see if he could see the helicopter. He was interested in seeing what type it was because of the light and the odd tracking and pacing behavior with the light. He had his window rolled down, as he often did to help him stay alert late at night. Dad realized he didn't hear any noises. None of the usual helicopter sounds that you'd expect. He began to feel uneasy, and just as he put it back into drive, the spotlight vanished. There's this creepy road in northern New Jersey, but it's really just a 10-mile stretch through woods with no lights or cell service. Tales of ghosts, the KKK, animal sacrifice, satanic rituals, car accidents, and trucks flashing their lights at you. My best friend and I used to drive it a lot, just because it was peaceful. Nothing ever happened, we were never scared. You drive to the very end, where houses start back up, then turn around, go back through, and go home. Until one night, at about 1 a.m., we couldn't sleep, so we made the drive, like 20 minutes, to the road itself. About halfway through, there's all this weird writing and symbolism. We'd never seen anything like it. We were a little freaked out and just kept saying, what the duck was that? But by the time we got to the end and turned around to go back, we were fine. When we get back to it, we pull over to get a better look. It was actually painted on, not chalk. We took some pictures, which, of course, after eight years, are gone, but we had no clue what anything was except the pentagrams. We figured it was just some people being funny, so we left. The next night, we told someone about it and piled in the car to go show them. Naturally, it was gone. There was no trace, even though it was paint. Near my apartment, there is a very windy road with a river on one side and a very steep hill covered in brush and trees on the other. Once, while driving on this road late at night, I got a sinking feeling in my stomach for what I assumed was absolutely no reason, until I took a turn. Standing in the middle of the road in the light of the only street light for yards was what looked like a very tall, emaciated, and deformed black dog. It had spindly legs that looked to have each been twisted, his coat was patchy all along his body, and he was at least three feet tall. I froze and immediately stopped the car. My lights were on him, but he just wasn't moving. I flashed on my brights, honked a little, and tried to move closer until his head suddenly flipped around to glare at me, and then I bolted up the side of this extremely steep hill. I did some light research on the lore of black dogs and found that finding a stranded black dog in the middle of the road or following you somewhere is a sign of death. It must be true, because my grandmother died shortly after this occurrence. One day, after I got out of my shift for work, I got into my car, which was pretty old, and I started to drive. It was like other times, I had to get home quickly because I had to pick up my daughter from play practice 30 minutes after I got home. The traffic was terrible. It would move an inch, like every 5 minutes. I would never get home in time. So, when I finally was able to turn around, I did and went another way, a way I had never gone before. Nobody was there except a truck and some parked cars. I kept driving, but something caught my eye. I drove past it, but my gut told me to turn around and see what it was. So I did, and to my horror, a small child, maybe three or four, was standing there, crying. The child looked bruised and beaten. I quickly got out of my car and asked the child if he was okay. He looked at me with a blank stare and pointed into the trees. Mum is dead, he said, and he started crying. My hands shaking, I called the cops, and when they arrived, they searched the area where the little child told them his mother was dead. Nothing was there. This is a true story, and it is the scariest thing that has ever happened to me. Quite a while ago, me and my friend were in his forest. A few hundred acres and very far from his house, about a 20-minute walk. We were just eating lunch when we decided to go down the hill into the bushy part of the forest, so we were walking, and we kept hearing weird snapping noises from the trees, but we didn't think much of it because we thought it was just a bird or something. Then we started hearing this loud drumbeat sound, and it just kept repeating, 
So we got scared and ran out of the forest to this sketchy gravel road. As we were standing in the middle of the road, my friend noticed a black bump on the road. For some weird reason, we ran towards it. It started moving, then got up, and me and my friend stopped dead in his. I stopped too as it got up, it had a big waist and a skinny body. It moved so fast that we were panicking, so my friend said to turn into the forest. We went into the forest with our hearts beating. We ran so fast that the beach smacked across our legs. I never ran so fast in my life. After a little while of running, we stopped. Neither me nor my friend heard anything, so we grabbed our stuff and ran back to his house. To this day, I and my friend have no clue what that was. I was with my wife, and we had to pick up my sister-in-law from work at midnight. We left around 1130 and got there at 12. There was a bit of a rainstorm going on at the time. Anyway, we pick her up, and then on the way back, we take a shortcut, so instead of getting back for 30 minutes past midnight, we should get there for 15-20 minutes past. On a long stretch of road, there seems to be a really big metallic slab in the air with six circles on it, think of Lego. We drive past it, and I don't say anything, and then a minute or two later, my wife says, that was a really weird thing we drove past in the air, and her sister is like, yeah, I was just like, oh, I thought I was the only one. Anyway, carry on driving, and it feels like we are driving on the same stretch of road in a loop, the surroundings are the same, etc., non-stop. I carry on driving for what feels like at least 45 minutes to an hour, but not really taking note, as my wife's sister is telling me which roads to take, it was only 5 to 6 roads, then we get home. We check the time, and it's past 1 am how is it possible that a short cut that was only meant to take 15 to 20 minutes took longer than the long way? And what was up with the weird object? And road. My daughter and her friend were driving home after eating out. Not especially late, maybe 10-ish, but dark as it was UK September. They were listening to music and shit like 20-something girls do. It was a great, relaxed evening. No alcohol for either, I really want to clarify. They went down a long, very rural road in Cambridgeshire with no houses for a few miles. So my daughter is calm and relaxed, but then out of nowhere she saw a little girl on the side of the road who seemed to have her hand raised, she said she looked about six. She told her friend quite hysterically to stop the car so they could go and have a look, as obviously she seemed so young and alone in a very unusual place at night. Absolutely no one there. She apologized to her friend for getting her to stop and being a little zealous over it, but her friend was in tears and said she was going to stop anyway as she had seen her too. They were utterly freaked out, and they are usually very level-headed girls. This was about six years ago, and no one believes them still, apart from me and my daughter's friend. Their story has never changed, not even when they feel embarrassed or are still teased about it. They describe the little girl as dark-haired and in a lightly colored dress that wasn't suitable for a September night, with her hand raised similarly to how you would put your hand up as a child in primary school to answer a question. They feel she was not dressed like a child at the time, if that makes sense. I honestly believe my daughter was in such a peculiar mood for quite some time afterward and is a very down-to-earth, honest young woman. You can find Crybaby Bridge on Whitesville Road in Columbus, Georgia. The story of Crybaby Bridge is one that has been passed around as an urban legend for years. As the legend goes, a poor farming family in Georgia found out they were expecting a fifth child. So the farmer made a pact with the delivery doctor to kill the baby immediately after it was born, without the wife's knowledge or consent. After the baby was born, the doctor walked the baby to the nearby bridge, throwing it to its death below. According to the legend, the baby's spirit still remains, as does the ghost of the mother, who searches endlessly for her child. It has been reported that while driving by the bridge on a full moon, you will hear the distant sound of a baby crying, along with the wails of a lost mother. Back in 1999, my mom was 17, and she was on a road trip with her aunt and cousin. They were going from Colorado to El Paso, Texas, and during the drive, they took Highway 54 through New Mexico. Then they made a pit stop in Vaughan, New Mexico, at an Allsup's once they got back into the car, they passed by a rundown diner, and then there was a light in the road. Then my mom's aunt cut the brakes. Then a little girl appeared. She had on something pink and appeared to have a doll in her hand as she was crossing the road. Due to the light, her face couldn't be seen, but she could see her hair, which was long and brown. She crossed the street from the driver's side to the passenger's side, where my mom was. Once she got to the corner of the car, she walked up to the passenger's side window but just stood here. At that instance, my mom closed her eyes, and she got a bad feeling. Her hair stood up, and her blood ran cold. At that point, my mom's aunt couldn't even react until my mom screamed to gun it at her. Her aunt floored it, 
and her aunt asked her to look back, but my mom denied it. Afterwards, my mom opened her eyes after a minute and saw that it was 3.03 am. So far, my mom has looked all over the internet for answers, but nobody has a story similar to her experience. There is a place in Nova Scotia known locally as Little Girl's Grave. It is the gravestone of a young girl named Catherine McIntosh. She died of an illness and was originally buried in McLennan's cemetery, however, due to a dispute with a neighbor, her body was dug up and moved to the side of Greenvale Road in front of the family farm. One night, I went with two friends to visit the gravestone. It was a dark and gloomy night. We drove down the eerie, winding dirt road until we came upon the location. We brought a toy to leave at the gravestone. The local lore surrounding this site says to leave a toy for her and to never take a toy away. It wasn't until we left and began driving down the dirt road that we had a paranormal experience. We noticed on the front windshield, in the condensation, a small child's footprint on the glass. It was so detailed and human-like. It scared us quite a bit, to say the least. One of the friends I had visited the grave site with worked at the same restaurant at the time. A few days after we had visited the site, we were working together, and we both heard something truly bizarre. It was the sound of a child laughing, very faintly. We both stared at each other in disbelief. We had no idea where the sound originated from, as there was no one around except the two of us. Not long after this, we fell out and have not spoken with each other since 2013. This is one of the only paranormal experiences that I have encountered in my life. If anyone who reads this has had any similar experiences at this gravestone, please share them with this community. I was driving through Valley Forge one evening, and it happened to be the night of the super blood? Moon last year. Whatever type of moon it was, it was gigantic in the sky and super bright. It was beautiful. I decided I should take a picture of it. While driving, I saw a parking area that had the gate open, so I pulled in but stopped at the entrance, not going all the way into the lot. It was about 9 p.m. I stopped the car and got my phone. I opened my door and stepped out to set up my shot on my camera. While I was standing next to my car and aiming my camera, I began to get an intense feeling of dread. I had every hair on the back of my neck and arms standing at attention. I started to feel as though I was being approached. I dreaded the thought and decided to risk a look. When I turned around, all I found was darkness. However, the feeling got worse. I actually felt like I had found the source but was unable to see it. I turned around again to face the moon and was shaking. I said into the night, I just want to take a picture of the moon, and I'll be leaving. With that, I felt a slight reprieve, and I took two photos. I don't think either was in focus or even what I wanted to take a picture of. Haha, ha, I was so scared, I went snap snap and quickly got back in the car. I shut the door and quickly put it in reverse. There was no way I was driving further into the lot to turn around. I never stopped there again at night. My name is James, and I used to love driving on this back road to my house after work until one night last week something made me change my mind. It was late at night, and I was headed home after work. I didn't like the regular road to my house because of the traffic, and this back road made what was an hour drive about 30 minutes, and I just liked the ambience. Anyway, I was headed home from work with no worries at all, listening to some radio. Then I suddenly noticed something strange. There seemed to be a fire coming from the distance, and I didn't make a lot of it because I'm from the country, Texas, to be exact, and it was pretty common for people to burn wood or their trash, which was strange since there was no sign of any civilization nearby. I kept driving until I came close to whatever it was. I saw it, it was a car that was on fire. I jumped out to check the car for anybody and found nothing, so I thought. I looked around to find a body on the ground. It was a woman who looked pretty young, probably in her mid-twenties. I checked to make sure she was okay, and she had a pulse, she probably passed out from all the smoke. I tried to wake her up, but she awoke pretty easily and asked me where her son was. I didn't know what she was talking about, so I told her, there's no one here. I checked all over the place. She replied, I have to find him, please help me. I attempted to calm her down by saying that I called the police, and they probably found him. But she screamed at me and told me that no one is going to take him away from me. I could tell that she wasn't healthy mentally, she probably had a concussion. I knew the best course of action was to take her to the ER. A few miles away from where we were. I'm going to spare you the details and tell you that I somehow convinced her to get into my back seat. On the way to the hospital, I could hear her muttering something in a weird language I had never heard before. I asked her what happened back there and if she could remember anything. I looked into my rear view and only saw that she was staring at me. The stairs were almost piercing through me. I asked if she was okay, and then she jumped at me, clawing my face with her nails. I slammed as hard as I could on the brakes, throwing her back and dazing her. 
I grabbed my pistol from the passenger glove box and got out. I forced her out of the car and told her if she tried anything, I would shoot her. She got out and ran into the dark. I never heard anything of her until yesterday. I was watching the news, and they were talking about a body found on that same road and confirmed it was her. So to tell you this story is to admit to myself that I believe it is fully true. A story that I have been long too scared to tell. My dad didn't think much when telling me this story, being a truck driver, he had seen much more interesting things while driving on the road. But this one was different because we never easily accepted the supernatural. It was a night like any other, far away from the comforts of home, alone, where your mind can play tricks on you. My dad was driving back home in his car, being a truck driver, he was used to driving long distances. Sometimes at night and alone. He was driving on an older mountain road at night while trying to fight off exhaustion. Of course, at this point, there's a lot that can be explained by a trick of the mind. However, seeing a black cat in the middle of the road was only the beginning. His mind was slow as he tried to process the animal on the road. Seeing roadkill was common, what wasn't expected was the cat running in front of his car. He tried slowing down, but it was too late. He felt the bump in his body as the car hit the poor animal. Coming to a stop, he got out of the car and went around to the front to move the cat out of the road. The night air was cold, and the darkness limited his field of vision. But he could see as clearly as day that there had never been a cat. Hitting an animal would leave something. A carcass in the road, a messy tire, even the smallest blood splatter. But there was nothing. Looking around, he noticed the woods on either side of the road, dark and beckoning. Going quickly back into the car, he tried to clear his mind before continuing on. It was such an unimportant moment that he tossed it aside and didn't think much of it. But then it happened again, the audible thump that he felt as he hit the cat. This time, he didn't stop. This time, he continued driving and instead looked in the mirror back at the road. He didn't see the cat now. He wouldn't bring up that moment for a while. The phantom cat still plagued him on dark roads while he was driving alone. It was always a cat. Sometimes it would run out of the woods. But he always felt the bump, that thud he felt in his whole body that meant he had hit something. And he never saw the cat after hitting it, always finding nothing. The next time it happened, he finally decided to bring it up to his co-workers, who had, in some cases, decades of driving experience. He expected them to joke about his sanity or not understand what he meant. He hadn't expected them to take him seriously and share their own experiences with the black cat. Although their stories were a bit different, rarely was it a cat for them. Instead, they told their stories of a black dog. A dog that disappeared as quickly as it appeared. Some of them felt the dog helped them by waking them up, but my dad felt that his interaction wasn't meant to be friendly or helpful. There was something ominous and looming about the cat. Something very wrong, like a warning or a bad omen. These moments continued to happen from time to time, and it was somewhat odd that it was a story shared by others. People who drove a lot, usually as part of their job. So when I saw the black cat and felt the woods call to me, I couldn't help but give in to what it wanted. The dark pines of the forest blocked the light of the moon. The howls sound human, but they are surely mountain lions. The forest is supposed to represent nature and freedom, but this is so unnatural. My mind is clouding over, and I can barely hear the crunch of moss and leaves underfoot. The far-off hoot of an owl. Shadows pass over my dull, blurred eyes. It's okay, nobody gives a second thought about a disappearance in the woods. October 30, 2010 I still remember that date. I was 20 years old, and it had been 4 years since the Goatman experience, and I wasn't trying to think about it now that it was getting towards Halloween. My friend, Nick, decided that we could do something scary for Halloween. The plan was to visit some scary old house out in the country that was abandoned and, today, has been demolished. But we also wanted to jump out and scare kids going out to trick or treat. So we decided to go out to the old house the day before. Besides, we assumed other people would be there for Halloween. It was already dark when we began driving down the country roads toward the house. None of the roads had names, but Nick had been there a few times in the past and knew his way there. He had told me about it, and I thought it would be an interesting idea. We wanted to keep the creepy factor high and drove slowly down the roads to savor every moment. At one point, there were just corn stalks on the road to the right of us and open fields on the left. Suddenly, there was a big bang and a thump on the front of the car that made the both of us jump. Nick hit the brakes and came to a quick stop. I thought we had hit a dog, but we didn't see one dart out in front of the car. I opened the car door and told Nick to stay inside in case someone was messing around and wanted to steal our car. I had nothing to defend myself with at all, I wasn't expecting anything like this to happen. I got on my hands and knees and peered into the darkness of the car. 
The moon was pretty bright, and there was enough light to see that there was nothing under the car. I walked along the side to the back and looked around. Nothing but a lonely, paved road. It was very quiet outside, no crickets were chirping or anything. There was no wind either, and there were no clouds up in the sky. I walked around the other side of the car and looked at the front. No blood stains or dents. I went to get back into the car when I heard the rustling of the cornstalks. It was like a person was walking through them. Hello? I asked. But there was no response. I couldn't see what was making the cornstalks move, but there was another sound, like heavy footsteps in the dirt. Then, behind me in the empty fields, it sounded like talking, like a group of people were talking. I didn't know what they were saying, but I could hear laughter too. I opened the car door and hopped inside. Nick couldn't hear the talking but was very worried. The car seemed strangely cold, although Nick may have turned on the air conditioner and turned it off when I got back inside. Let's get the duck out of there. I told him. Nick turned the car around, and just as we had begun driving back, I saw him look in the mirror and stop the car. He rolled down his window. I looked in my mirror and saw what I saw. There was a man who just stepped out of the cornfield. Nick yelled out to the guy if he needed any help. The man started walking towards the car, and Nick slammed his foot on the gas, and we flew down the road. We were speeding pretty fast, and I began telling him to do the speed limit in case we got pulled over by the police. He ignored me, and we drove like that until we got to a gas station and pulled into there. He was shaking when he told me what he saw. When the guy started walking towards the car, Nick said he saw people in the open field stand up off the ground and start making their way towards the car faster than the guy walking. They had been where I heard the voices and laughter. I still wonder what could have happened to the two of us had we still stayed in our car and waited for them. It's so creepy to think I was out in the open, just several feet away from them. This was back in 2005. At about 26 at the time, I stopped at a rest area to sleep along I-40 near Needles to rest a bit. It was about 3 a.m. when I stopped. The left window of my car opened a crack, as it was a hot summer night. All of a sudden, I was awakened to footsteps crunching swiftly and deftly close to and towards my car on my driver's side. I was tired, so I couldn't really shake awake and didn't feel I was in real danger, as I knew my doors were locked. I was just alert. I then heard my door handle lift and drop back down. Someone had checked to see if my door was unlocked. I never was able to shake awake but haven't slept in a rest area since. I'll stop to rest, but I won't sleep. This happened a few years ago on a road called Riverdale. This road is known to be haunted, as many people have died on it. The most common story of this road is about the little girl who went missing, and some of her remains were found on this road. Also, there are some cult members who live on this road. There are some houses, but a lot of them are on open roads with fields surrounding them. There are very few lamp posts. If you turn off your headlights, it is complete darkness for most of the drive. I have had many bad encounters and scary things happen to me on this road, both paranormal and non-paranormal. This one story is true and is the sketchiest paranormal experience I've had on this road. My mom and I had wanted to drive on this road but were too scared to go alone. Our friends lived close to this road and offered to take us down the road. Before we left, we did research and found a story about a man who was jogging at night when he was hit by a car speeding down the road. The car sped away, and the man died there. People had written stories about how they could see his spirit jogging at night sometimes and also that he was very angry. There were many other ghost stories, but this one intrigued us the most. We drove down the road, which is a very long road, BTW, not really expecting much because we were all a little skeptical, but the jogger's story was definitely in the back of our minds. It was about 10 p.m. when we pulled up to a section that had construction. We saw a construction worker in a vest and hard hat walking on the road. There was no one else around, and we thought it was odd that there was still a construction worker around at that time of night. We stopped the car in the middle of the road and rolled down the window to talk to him, since he was walking in our direction. There was something off about him. In the dim light from that lamp post, he didn't have many facial features that I could make out, but he looked really pissed off. He was going to yell at us to leave. Then I noticed that his eyes looked completely white, almost glowing. His fingertips were, too. We also noticed that he was gradually picking up his speed. When he got closer to our car, he started running lightning fast towards it. In panic, my friend slammed her foot on the gas, and we sped out of there. His face was close to the window, and I got a good glimpse of him before we drove off. It looked as if he was going to run right into the car. The part that freaks all of us out the most is that not even five seconds later, we turned around to see if he was chasing us, and he was gone. Completely vanished. We didn't see the neon vest at all, which would have made it easy to see him. Just a wide open road, a field, 
and the construction. I was 18 when this story took place, in the winter of 2015, it's not super long and not particularly scary, though I sure was terrified when it happened. It was on a logging road south of Swan Lake, Montana, sort of near Beaver Creek, I believe. There was a decent amount of snow on the ground. I was visiting home in Swan Lake, Montana, for a couple days, and my little sister, 17F, and I wanted to go for a drive and listen to music. So we drive for a good 20 minutes away, find this back road, and pull off a good distance from the main road so no one would see us. It was pitch black out, and in winter, it's so dead silent at night that it's eerie. Especially out in the boonies like that. I left my headlights on because I had this creepy feeling like we were being watched, but I just figured it was a deer or something. I'd seen moose on that road before, so I knew it was busy. My sister and I were having a conversation when I looked out into the trees, and I swear I saw this emaciated pale white humanoid type thing just barely trying to hide behind a tree. It was still in the darkness beyond my headlights, so it kind of melted into the shadows. I stared at it for a long time. My sister was involved with something she was talking about, so she was oblivious to my change in mood. I couldn't take my eyes off of it, it had this misshaped head that was too big for its thin body. And its eyes were two huge black, unblinking marbles. It didn't move or do anything, so I kind of told myself it was just something I was seeing in the shadows, it was just beyond the light enough that I could write it off that easily, I guess. I went back to talking with my sister for a while and decided to see if I could still see the shape of the creature in the shadows, and the next time I looked up, it was closer, now just at the edge of the light. I felt so scared that my eyes filled with tears. It was sort of hunched to its right side and was standing with a rounded back with its bony, weird hands in a claw shape. I had pulled into the beginning of a single lane road that was plowed 10 feet in, there was no room for me to turn around, so I had to back out. I made the terrible mistake of just gunning it backwards, every time I kept looking back, it was closer and closer. I ripped the plastic covering off of the driver's side mirror, almost hitting a tree in my rush. I hate to say that I left it there, I was too scared to stop and pick it up. Sorry, mother nature. My sister never saw the thing. She was super confused about why I randomly decided to get quiet and then book it out. We drove for a while longer, but I didn't pull off anywhere. I still felt really creeped out. It took me a while to get comfortable going out in the woods alone or driving down back roads alone at night again. I definitely still have no clue what it was, it wasn't some confused hiker wandering around naked, but it had the upright body of a person. It looked kind of like those Dover Demon sketches, but I was between Swan Lake and Sealy Lake Montana, and it was white and ashen. So this was actually a series of events. All of this happened around 2002 or 2003. So this was actually a series of events. I live in an extremely rural area in the south, where people still hold strong to their textile job roots and don't have any incentive to modernize the area. Decent jobs were scarce, unless you wanted to drive 50 to 75 miles one way with no guarantees that the pay would cover more than the cost of gas every week. I was between jobs, so to make ends meet, I started delivering newspapers till something better came along. So I had been on this job for maybe three months when I met my, now ex, boyfriend. He started to ride along with me, which I really didn't mind. It gave me someone to talk to, besides my Rottweiler, and it helped me get done faster. Fast forward a couple more months. One night, I was running at least three hours late because of an issue with the printing press, but I needed a pit stop. Being so far behind, I didn't have time to drive back to the nearest gas station which was 15 minutes away. I was out on this one lane gravel road that's really more like a multiple outlet driveway than an actual road. It always gave me a creepy feeling, but I chalked it up to there being no lights around anywhere and the trees lining both sides, except where it jutted off to go to a house. I'm at my last stop on this road, so I decided to back my car up into my usual turnaround, then hopped out and went back into the woods a little ways. As I was finishing up with my call of nature, I started to notice my immediate surroundings. I was in the middle of a completely bare circle. I mean bare. No grass, shrubs, or even leaves had fallen from the trees. Just bare earth. I immediately felt like I was somewhere I shouldn't be, so I quickly walked back to my car. I didn't say anything to my boyfriend, I just calmly drove away and continued my route. After I got off that road, I had to do a bit of backtracking, then turn around and pass back by that same road. As we were coming back by that road, my boyfriend inhaled sharply and went pale. Naturally, I asked him what was wrong, but he wouldn't say anything, so I shrugged it off and kept driving. Later that morning, after we were done and I was driving him home, he finally told me what he saw. Just writing this still sends a shiver down my spine. He said that when we drove back past the road, 
there was a cloaked figure standing on the side of the road, and as we drove by, it raised its arm and pointed a long bony finger directly at me. He didn't elaborate as to whether the finger was only bone or just very thin and looked bony, and I didn't feel the need to make him elaborate, I was creeped out enough, fast forward a few weeks. Same road, same scenario, except he needed the pit stop instead of me. He didn't walk back into the woods like I did, he just stepped out of the car and turned his back. As he's finishing up, I hear him cry out and jump back in the car. He slams the door and starts yelling for me to hurry and go. As I'm calmly starting to drive away, I hear something hit my windshield out of nowhere. In my confusion, I stop and exclaim, what the hell was that? Of course, my boyfriend is still yelling for me to just go, and as I'm starting to drive off again, this time I see a rock come flying out of the darkness and hit my windshield. At that point, I floored it. Several miles down the road, my boyfriend tells me that he had a rock hit him in the side of the face when he went to get back in the car. I would like to point out that as I was driving away, I was looking at both sides of the road, and even in the darkness, I saw nothing. I was moving fast enough that if anyone had been there playing a prank, I would have seen them running away, yet slow enough so I didn't spin out on the gravel and wreck my car. After that, things calmed down on that road. Nothing else ever happened. Fast forward about 4 months. Things had just felt off all night. My boyfriend and I hadn't been talking like normal. We weren't fighting, but things just felt tense and uneasy. There was just an overall sense of dread and foreboding that neither of us could shake. Same route, different road. This road had one of those old bridges with the metal support beams and an arch above it. Beautiful bridge in daylight, kind of creepy at night. I had just crossed this bridge and was heading to my first customer, about a half mile away. While I'm driving up to this box, my boyfriend usually rolls his window down to get the next box on the opposite side of the road. This night, he just sat there, staring straight ahead, refusing to even look out his window. When I asked him if he was going to get that box, he shook his head violently and gave me the closed mouth nah uh At that point, I turned and looked at him. His face is pale, and I could see the genuine fear in his eyes. I ask him what's wrong, and he asks me if I can see the skeleton face thing looking at him through the window. I lean up and look over past him, and I see nothing. Then I looked in my side mirror. To this day, I wish I hadn't. In my side mirror, I see what I can only describe as a goblin. Just for the sake of describing it so others may get a better mental image, it looked like an orc from the Lord of the Rings movies, just corporeal in form with milky white eyes that had a green reflection to them. I quickly looked away, hoping I had just imagined it, and felt my stomach drop when I looked back and it was still there. As I'm looking at this thing the second time, it tilts its head and grins, revealing a mouth full of jagged, rotting teeth. At that point, I'm so terrified that my fight or flight instinct kicked in, and I floored it. That thing held onto the side of my car, or moved along with it, I can't say for certain which, for at least a couple hundred feet before I forced myself to break its gaze and not look back. After that, I finished the rest of my route and didn't finish delivering to that road until well after daybreak. I also took the next available job I could find, decent pay or not. I have never been back on either of those roads since I quit, and I have no plans to change it either. So, this story is from two or three years ago. One night, on my way home from work, to get home, I took some back roads as shortcuts. But on this particular night, it was snowing and the roads were a little icy, so I was driving slower than I normally do. On this road I normally take day in and day out, there is a long stretch of road that has hills, can be rough sometimes, and has no houses, hunting camps, or any other turnoffs. It's about 3 or 4 miles until the next intersection. I was about a quarter mile down this road when I saw in my rear view mirror another car or truck coming up behind me as I was going up the first hill on this stretch of road. I was about halfway up this hill when they passed me. As I crested the hill, I was expecting to see them going down the hill or on the short straightway to the next hill, but I did not see any taillights. So, I slowed down, thinking they had gone off the road and crashed. As I was coming down the hill, I was looking for the car or truck that passed me, but I couldn't see much of anything, so I stopped at the bottom of the hill and put my four ways on. I got out of my truck with my flashlight and started to walk up the hill, scanning the side of the road to see if I didn't find anything. I ended up reaching the top of the hill without finding any trace of the vehicle that passed me. So, I thought to myself, maybe then I wanted off the road on the other side of the road, but I still found nothing. There are no tracks, no skid marks, and no evidence of a vehicle going off the road or even driving on it except for me. There have been numerous accidents on this road. In conclusion to this story, I strongly believe that I saw a ghost car that was stuck in a loop on the night it crashed. We were driving through the Australian outback about 10 years ago, 
and there was literally nothing around us as far as the eye could see. The road is barely wide enough for two cars, so when we see something approaching, usually a massive road train, we pull off the road to give way and wait until it passes. We'd been driving for a while, and it was now dark. Off in the distance, we could see headlights approaching. We pulled over and waited for them to pass. After a few minutes, we realized they weren't getting any closer, so we got back on the road and started driving. Maybe they had stopped for us too in a polite standoff? We were traveling at highway speeds, yet the lights never seemed to get any closer, and eventually they just vanished altogether without explanation. Keep in mind that the outback is as flat as it is vast, so we could see for miles in every direction. The most likely answer is that we encountered the Min Min lights. An unexplained phenomenon that occurs in the region we were driving. Me and my sister used to go up to northern Maine to our parents' cabin to drink, party, or relax. The cabin is very rural. The 13-mile logging road to the cabin isn't even paved and is frequently covered in fallen trees. About nine years ago, we were heading up there to relax while we were both on break from college. We got a late start heading up there, and by the time we got close, it was already dark. I pulled onto the logging road, and as soon as I pulled in, my truck got stuck in the mud. I put it in four-wheel drive and went to put it in reverse to floor it out of the mud and drive on the mud-packed portion of the road. As a habit, I looked out the rear window before I hit the gas in reverse. I saw headlights behind me. I thought that was suspicious given the time of night in the rural area. I told my sister to stay in the truck, and I was going to tell them this is private property and they need to turn around. I flipped on these flood lights I had on the back rack of my truck, it makes it easier to back up trailers in the dark, and got out. As soon as I got out, the car and headlights were gone. I was kind of confused because I didn't hear an engine. So I ran about 40 feet to the paved road and looked down it on the west and east sides, and there was nothing. There are no tail lights or headlights. There is not any noise, but my truck is idling. I went back to my truck, and my sister said, who was it? I said, you saw that car, right? And she said, yes, who was it? And I said no one was there. I looked. My sister didn't believe me, and she even got out and looked, then looked down the paved portion of the road and saw nothing as well. We were both sort of sitting there for about three minutes looking at each other, like, what just happened? I could never explain that experience. I still think about it to this day. That cabin became less relaxing after that experience, I was always sort of paranoid when I went up there after that. So, I live in a county that was pretty rural until the last 10 or 15 years. The biggest town in our county is pretty crowded now. It is overcrowded, and I hate it. I moved from there to the countryside. I like where I live except that it can be really creepy at night because, for miles and miles, it's dark and there are no streetlights. One thing about this county is that the main roads always get backed up real quick, whether there's an accident or whatever, so it pays to go on the back roads. The back roads, like any other rural place, are less populated, dark, and have lots of trees. And no sidewalks. Anyway, a few years ago, something happened that almost made me stop using them. I was driving home kind of late one night. I decided to take one particular back road that shaved off 10 minutes from my commute home. I was tired and had to get up early, so I was going fast, trying to get home soon. This road is a little more populated than some, but it is super spooky in some stretches because huge trees are along the road and their branches and leaves make a tunnel of sorts. So, I'm zipping through and rounding a curve. Up ahead, I see what I thought was a giant garden flag, you know the flags that people put up in spring in their yards? Well, I thought it was a weird flag because it seemed like it was fairly tall and large, and it was in the middle of the road. As I get closer, my headlights hit it, and it's not a flag, it is a person. A lady. She was wearing a red fez, I live in rural Maryland, you just don't see a fez every day, a long, flowy white dress, and an orange reflective sash across her chest. It's a little strange because she's in the middle of the street. As I drove past her, it got weirder. As dark as it was, as I drove by, I could see she was about 60. She had glasses, and I could see her bright blue eyes. She looked in my passenger window, and she started doing this weird bounce thing. I thought she was going to try and get into my car. Mind you, I'm going pretty fast. I don't know what it was about her, but she freaked me the duck out. I didn't think she would rob me, I really thought she was a soul snatcher or a skin walker. I honestly didn't think she was human. I can't adequately describe how creepy she was. I sped past her as fast as I could. I kept glancing in my backseat to make sure she had not materialized in my car. I prayed, recited scripture, and kept watch in my rearview mirror. It was spring, so a little warm, but I felt bone-chillingly cold. 
I finally make it home, and I run in to tell my mom the story. I got in just as my brother was telling my mom about this weird lady he saw as he was driving. It was the same lady, but he saw her at the intersection of the highway and the back road, whereas I saw her further down the road. We both had the same reaction. She also tried looking in his car. She was also bouncing around when he saw her. He said there was a car in front of him that sped off so fast when they drove past the lady. My brother was so freaked out that he won't travel that road anymore, even during the day. Eventually, I found out that the lady lives in the woods. Apparently, at one time, her family lived on that road. Her father was ill, and she tried to take him to the hospital. He died on the way there, and she drove around with his body in her car for hours. I guess she has mental health issues, and I think she lost the house or got kicked out. I have friends that live off of that street, so when I was talking about it, they knew exactly who it was. I still go on that road, but I haven't seen her since. I do hope she's okay, but I really do not want to run into her again. This is an absolutely true story that my fiancé and friends still talk about to this day. Back in high school, my hoodrat friends and I would often hit back roads to listen to music and smoke weed, nothing else to do in a tiny midwestern town. We were riding five deep, getting high, jamming out, as usual. I was driving. We were out in the middle of nowhere on a dark, curvy road. We immediately became paranoid when we saw two headlights appear behind us. It was nearly 2 a.m., and it was rare to see people out that late. The car came right up behind us and was riding my ass pretty close. By this point, I'm convinced it's the police, and they're getting my plate number before pulling me over. All of our buttholes are clenched in the impending doom of cop interaction. But the car never flashed its lights on. Ten minutes pass, and the car is still following closely on a dark back road. Now we have moved past the police possibility, and we have moved on to the definitely a serial killer slash jeeper creeper assumption. I drive faster to try to lose them, but they speed up to keep pace. I'm about a minute away from actually calling the cops myself. Right at the peak of the chase, we are literally on a dirt road that none of us know the name of when we go up a hill and around a curve. I look back to see where the pursuing vehicle has gone, and it is gone. There are no headlights in my rear view. There was no road or driveway for the car to have turned on yet the car had disappeared. I have avoided back roads late at night since then. That ghost car haunts my dreams sometimes. I was driving with my girlfriend at the time when we saw a hitchhiker up the road waving his hand frantically. I normally drive past hitchhikers, but my girlfriend was a better person than I was and said we should pull over and ask if everything was okay. It turns out he just needed a ride and would use that frantic wave technique to attract passing drivers. Anyway, my girlfriend said we'd be happy to give him a ride and when asking where he was going, he sort of did that thing when someone doesn't answer but pins the question back on you. We told him we were going to a campsite that was about 40 minutes away, and he said it was his lucky day because he was heading to the town about 15 minutes away from the site. I didn't think anything of it, obviously, and just continued driving until he started asking us some weird questions. He wanted to know how long we'd be staying, if it was a quiet place, if we'd be alone or meeting up with family or friends, basically, just all weird stuff like that. I was getting a weird feeling, but we still carried on driving until we reached his destination, and he got out and thanked us. I knew then and there something wasn't right with him, and I told my girlfriend we should follow where he was going since the town was pretty dead and what he would be doing here. I drove up the street, as if I were leaving the town, and then quickly did a 360 degree turn when we were out of sight of him. I then bombed it back down the road until I found him again, and we drove slowly behind him, obviously leaving a good distance so it wouldn't be suspicious. We watched as he did the frantic wave again, and a car pulled over and let him in. My girlfriend and I were shocked because why would he be getting into another car if we had dropped him off at his destination? We decided to tail the car, and to our shock, it was heading to the campsite we were staying at. This is when we knew things were suspicious and decided to call the cops, and it turns out they were looking for him as he had done this before, just at another campsite, but he had gotten away. He later admitted to getting a ride from the couple he killed. So, First, let me start by saying that I have done a decent bit of driving. Not as a professional or anything like that, but it's always been very meditative for me, so I've had plenty of drives with no destination in mind. The point is, I'm no stranger to night driving. So a couple years ago, we moved to a popular tourist destination along the coast of the US. There's only one major highway in the state because it's run by incompetent idiots. Who knows? So there are a lot of accidents. In fact, I had just gotten T-boned a month prior to this and rear-ended less than a week after getting my car back. There were so many accidents. There are too many state drivers with no police presence, but I digress. 
As it is, I also have to take this same highway to and from work every day, so I have been witness to quite a few wrecks. If I see them happen, I always stop and make sure everyone is okay, that they have working phones, etc. I should also mention that long stretches of this road are nothing but swampy forests, marshes, for miles at a time. So, like any other day, I'm driving home from work and getting to one of these isolated sections. I see up ahead a silver four-story, and as I'm getting closer, the passenger's door opens, and someone gets out and starts waving their arms. As I slow down, it looks like the front end has bad damage, and I figure it's another hit and run, so I pull off to the side and throw it in the park. Once I get out and make my way to the car, though, it's deserted. There is not a living soul around, save for the cars flying by, and the driver's window is all busted out. It had rained the night before, and this car had obviously been there during the storm because it was soaked and had a little grass and leaves on the seat. I did a quick scan of the tree line to make sure they hadn't tumbled down the bank or something, but nobody. Nothing. I even called out once and got no response. There was no orange sticker on it, indicating the police had flagged it as abandoned, and when I drove by the next morning, it wasn't there. I have no idea what happened, but I know what I saw, and the passenger door definitely opened and someone definitely got out of the car. The whole thing was so weird, I seriously felt like I was losing it for a second because it was also so clear and vivid. I saw the guy's face, not just something out of the corner of my eye. The best paranormal explanation I've been able to come up with is that it was some sort of imprint or residual haunting-like thing. I do believe traumatic events can leave a mark, and a car accident is pretty traumatic. So yeah. Not super duper scary or anything, but it definitely gave me the creeps and had me checking my sanity for a minute. The first experience I am going to share happened a few months ago, in September. I was laying in bed watching TV when my friend texted me, asking if I wanted to hang out and go take some pictures. I had nothing else to do, and I was tired of watching TV, so I told him to let me get dressed first, and he could come pick me up. Once he picked me up, we began discussing where we should go to take the pictures. We decided on going to a park that had some really nice scenery and plenty of spots for good pictures. After 45 minutes of walking around the park and taking pictures, the sun was beginning to set, so we decided to go home. So we're driving home, and my friend is telling me about some dude he knows who has started making music, and he wanted to show me some of his songs. He puts a song on, and then puts his phone in the cup holder next to him. We hit a bump in the road, and his phone popped out and landed on the floor. He reached down to get it and couldn't immediately find it, so he was digging around, not paying attention to the road at all, so I turned to look at it for him. That's when my stomach sank, and I screamed his name and told him to swerve. He quickly looked at the road, but by then it was too late. A man was standing on the road. Literally just standing. It seemed incredibly stupid to me at the time, but I had more important things to worry about. We both immediately hopped out to see if he was okay, but when we got to the front of the car, there was nothing. The car wasn't even damaged. No blood, nothing. We looked around to see if he had possibly been sent flying. It was level ground, and there were no trees around, so it wasn't hard to get a good look around the area despite it getting darker. Obviously frightened at the thought of us running over a potential vengeful spirit, we got back in the car and dashed. I have some stories about a weird road that I want other people's opinions on. I haven't found many online sources about this road being haunted, but I'm talking about the Windy Hill Road, also known as Murder Hole Road, between Limavady and Coleraine in Northern Ireland. I was over visiting family last summer, and I had a possible experience while on the road, and then family members started telling me their experiences. My story is that after talking about that road, my grandparents said they would drive me to see the statue of Cushy Glen. As soon as we turned onto the road, I was getting the chills. This could be, of course, due to the fact that I was already creeped out by him, but as far as I can remember, I hadn't been told any paranormal stories at that point. After visiting the statue, we got in the car, and my grandpa started telling me his stories. I was saying how it was so strange and was trying to make sense of it when my phone started acting up. My phone was only a few months old and had never done this before, it was switching between apps, and then it eventually switched off. I tried to put this down to just a glitch, but the weird thing was that it didn't switch on until we were off that road. As soon as we left the road, it worked. Now this could just be a glitch, and I think my grandpa's stories are better. The first one is that he was driving along this road at night, this road is weird during the day, never mind at night and he had a hymn CD playing. He said that when he was on the road for three miles straight, it sounded as if 1000 demons were screaming and that once he was off the road, it stopped. The second story is that he was driving in the dark, again, over a bridge and around a corner. He saw a tall, very thin man, almost seven feet, 
wearing a cap and a long jacket disappear under the bridge. Once he drove past the bridge, he got out, my grandpa has no fear, ha ha, to look for him, and he was nowhere to be seen. My grandma and great great aunt had secondary stories to tell. One man was driving along at night, in fact, all of these stories were at night, and stopped in a layby to have a rest as he was very tired, he might have been a lorry driver, I can't remember. When he woke up, his skin was crawling, and then he felt something scratch the back of his head. The final story is that a man was cycling, this was years and years ago, when something jumped out of the trees and started running along with him. Of course, this could be an animal, but apparently, although it was running on all fours, it was rather humanoid in appearance. My grandpa would never lie about these things, and neither would my grandpa, so I don't feel as ready to disregard these stories, despite my usual skepticism about anything paranormal. What could these occurrences be caused by? Many people were murdered by highway men, and the most infamous one, Cushy Glenn, was killed by someone he was trying to rob. This happened to me years ago, it still seems like yesterday. I was driving with my girlfriend to her parents' house to celebrate her father's birthday. Mind you, the trip from where I live to her parents is a six-hour drive. We packed things up, gifts and some other small stuff. And we were ready to go. The journey at the beginning was fine, there was not much traffic, and it was very nice weather, considering it was the start of spring. Then, out of nowhere, I got a flat tire, not a problem. I am a handy guy, and I replaced it. But it took a while, and the evening was approaching. I was driving using maps. The road I was going down was new to me. My girlfriend started napping, and I said to wake her up when we were near. I said okay. She was working long hours the day before. Maps was showing the road through wood. I had a suspicion that maybe the map was not showing the right way, because from time to time maps does that. It changes the direction, out of nowhere, that kind of thing. When I reached the forest, I stumbled across a small parking lot. It was very old, and it seemed nobody really used it. Patches of grass were uncut, and the road to the park was full of holes. And surprise, surprise, maps changed the direction. I stopped in the parking lot, there was nobody around. I turned off the engine but left the headlights on. I was checking my phone for new directions. And I didn't really pay attention to what was going on around me, but just then I saw three men in front of my car, very close. They were approaching stealthily, and they were coming toward my car. I turned on the engine, reversed the car, and was driving as fast as I could. As I was backing away, I saw the face of one of the men, it was creepy. He had no real emotion, no anger. But his eyes, his eyes said it all. He had evil intentions. My girlfriend woke up, and she started asking what I was doing. I told her someone was chasing us. Apparently, I screamed and was shaking while driving, so she knew I wasn't messing around. I didn't care where, I wanted to escape this forest ASAP. I was looking in my mirror every 10 minutes. That was the creepiest thing that happened in my life. I didn't know who those men were. So a while ago, I went to the coast with my so and traveled through Portland and down Highway 26, to Highway 53, Nekanakam Highway, and to Highway 101, but we had a great day, and were heading home at roughly 10 p.m., and we got onto Highway 53, which is poorly maintained. Winding road for 20 to 30 miles and saw four cars going the other way the whole way, and towards the end I came around a corner cutting on the inside because I was having fun while my girlfriend was half asleep when I saw a flash of tail lights go around a bend up ahead, so I thought, I must have caught up to a car, which is odd because I was going fast the whole time, and then I realized that the road immediately cut off and down to the left to go downhill, so I was wondering why a car was on top of the mountain and going so fast. I brushed it off and kept driving down the hill until, after a left corner and a straight stretch right before a right turn, I saw another pair of tail lights flash down at the bottom and go right around a bend, so then again I thought, the road must turn left after this corner and curve back around. I soon realized that the road didn't turn left for a half mile, and there was no possible way I could see car lights moving that fast in the woods in the middle of nowhere. That's when I started to get creeped out and think of eyes. A situation popped into my head at the time, and it was, what if I popped my tire and people came out of the woods? At that point, I started speeding a little more because I was getting chills and a dark feeling. Nothing happened for a while, and we made it to Highway 26 when the feeling of dread or something terrible was, had, or was going to happen when I told my girlfriend, who was waking up at the time, that I had seen random taillights, and she suddenly said, people in the woods. This immediately shut me up and gave me the chills, and to top it off, she said, I couldn't stop thinking about what if we popped our tire and people came out of the woods. I got out of those woods as fast as I could. Is there any activity by cults or ghosts on those highways? 
the internet won't show me anything, and the one website I found on that highway with reported hauntings won't load for me. Any locals know anything about those woods? I was on an assignment for the Army, making my way up from San Antonio, Texas, to Tacoma, Washington. It was a long drive, and they gave me six days to report to my new unit, but I didn't mind. I love road trips. This was January, and the days were short, so maximizing the amount of daylight I had was crucial. I got up extra early that morning, carried the last of my bags out to my Corolla, signed out of my old unit, and hit the road at roughly 5 a.m. It was an amazing day. I saw the landscape transform around me as I headed farther west than I had ever been in my life. I went from the San Antonio metropolitan area to the savannas of the Edwards Plateau, and I saw the welcome to New Mexico, the land of enchantment sign. Now I was really in the middle of nowhere. Continuing on US Route 380, I eventually found myself in Roswell. The next day, I continued to Albuquerque, then westward on Interstate 40. By the time I reached Gallup and started northbound on US Route 491, I still had two hours of driving left before crossing the border into Colorado and another 45 minutes before I would get to Cortez, my planned stop for the night. But looking back on it now, I figured that, had I decided to stop in Albuquerque instead of Roswell the night previous, I would have already been in Colorado by now and possibly be making my way into Utah. I would have saved myself from what was waiting for me on that desolate highway. Route 491 stretched far into the Navajo Nation. On either side of me were endless expanses of prairie, bookended by dark indigo mountains on the horizon. To my left, the sky glowed a faint orange purple, the light slowly dying down like smoldering embers in a fire until finally plunging the land into darkness. Every now and then, I would see the forlorn headlights of another car passing by, which gave me a bit of relief that I wasn't alone. I also had my road trip playlist on to keep me company. Call me ironic, but Hotel California was playing. After passing the small, lonely town of Newcomb, the next piece of civilization would be Shiprock. However, between the two was a 36-mile stretch of absolute nothingness. An abyss I had to cross. I was not ready for what I was about to witness. After several miles and having not seen another car on the road, I saw something strange emerge from the horizon. Barely lit by the moonlight, I thought it was a road sign at first. Then, as I came closer, I realized it was a person walking on the shoulder of the road, heading in my direction. I squinted, trying my hardest to focus on the figure. In the darkness, I could tell they were wearing a poncho of some sort, with long, black hair flowing down past their chest. Who could be walking out here, all alone, at night? I thought. Whoever it was, they had no lights, no reflectors, and no strobes of any kind to signal to passing cars that they were there. And they walked on the pavement, dangerously close to oncoming traffic. I pulled to the left a bit, giving them a wide berth. Suddenly, my stereo cut out, as if I had turned it off. The screen went completely dark, and my phone disconnected from Bluetooth. While this was unusual, it certainly did happen from time to time, so I thought nothing of it. As I approached, I saw the person raise their right arm, as if to flag me down and hitch a ride. Oh, no 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 no, I thought. There's no way that's happening, buddy. As my headlights swept by, I realized it was a man, dressed in a button-up shirt, a wool poncho, jeans, and cowboy boots. His large belt buckle glinted as the lights passed him. But in that split second, I realized with abject shock that not only were his eyes painfully wide open, but they seemed to be tracking me. Somehow, he was able to see me through the glare of my headlights and look me dead in the eyes, not breaking contact until I passed. I was shaken for a bit, but my nerves gradually subsided. My stereo abruptly turned back on, and my music continued playing. I brushed everything off as simply my imagination. The darkness and the shadows are playing tricks on my mind. Besides, the man was behind me. I figured he must have been drunk. Indian reservations sadly had high rates of alcoholism. I looked in my rearview mirror. He was gone. I couldn't see him. Maybe he's too far behind me? No, that couldn't be. It must be too dark. Maybe. I drove on, trying to figure out what had just happened, but at the same time, forcing myself not to think about it. Just when I thought I had moved on, I saw another shape in the distance. As I got closer, I realized it was another figure. Another person walking alone at night? There's no way. They walked along the shoulder of the road, swaying back and forth. Slowly, I could make out that this person was also wearing a poncho. Then I saw what looked like long, black hair, reaching down past the chest. No. There's no way. It was the man. The same man. But how? The man raised his arm again, trying to flag me down. 
What did this guy want? I kept up my pace, with no intention of stopping for any reason. Just like last time, my stereo turned off again. Suddenly, the man leapt out onto the road, arms waving frantically. I swerved into the left lane, narrowly avoiding him. In my headlights, I noticed he had the same wide-eyed look, his gaze locked onto mine. I also saw that his clothes did not look as they did in our first encounter. Once they were clean, if not well-worn, but now they were soiled and tattered, rags barely hanging onto his withered frame. His hair was wild and unkempt, with clods of dried dirt stuck in the locks. But his eyes remained the same, my heart nearly burst through my chest at the sudden shock. Hyperventilating, I slowed down and glanced into the rearview mirror to make sure he was alright. Nothing could have prepared me for what I was about to see. The man was running. He was sprinting toward me. I centered the wheel and accelerated, hoping to get as much distance from him as possible. But as I continued to speed up, so did he. Faster and faster I drove, but every time I looked in the mirror, I would still see him right behind me, perfectly keeping pace, his body tinted red by my tail lights. I could feel my temples throbbing and my hands getting slick with sweat on the steering wheel. I was sick to my stomach. There's no way. I looked forward, hoping to see a faint glimmer of light from the town ahead. But I was still too far away. I looked back at the rearview mirror. The man was gone. I should have been relieved, but I knew better. Where did he go? I looked around, hoping to regain a visual of him. I couldn't see anything. Taking a deep breath, I refocused on the road but kept my guard up. Just keep driving, I told myself. There are only a few more miles to go. Out of the corner of my right eye, I saw something. Another shape. It wasn't the man, at least, I didn't think so. I glanced over, bracing myself for whatever was going to meet my eye. It looked like an animal. Some kind of animal, though I couldn't make out exactly what it was. Under the moonlight, I could see it running alongside my car, its forelimbs reaching out in long strides, and its back undulating like a dog. Closer and closer, it came. The closer it was, the more of it I could see. Little by little. Then I noticed that its limbs were far too long for its body. Its body was too short. It had no tail. The head was oddly round. And from it came a trail of long, black hair. I slammed my foot on the gas, pushing my car's engine harder than it had ever been pushed before. By now, I was clocking well over 110 miles per hour. But this creature kept up. It wasn't phased. It simply ran faster and faster to match my speed. Just what was this thing? How could anyone, or anything, run this fast? The entity seemed to have endless stamina. Just how long could it keep this up? Just how much faster could it go? Soon, my car would hit its top speed. And then what? How long could it maintain that before breaking down? It wouldn't be long until my engine overheated. But regardless, I would eventually run out of gas. And when I do, what would happen if that thing got me? At 120 miles per hour, my car had reached its limit. This was the fastest I could go. But the creature continued its pursuit. My temperature gauge was approaching the red, and so was my tachometer. I couldn't keep this up any longer. Suddenly, like the beacon of a lighthouse on a tumultuous sea, the first light of shiprock came into view. It was close. So close. If I could just go a little longer, I could make it into town. To safety. I pressed on. I fixed my eyes on the lights, which were growing brighter on the horizon. They bloomed outward, glimmering in the night air. Though it was a small town, it was a sight for sore eyes in my situation. Looking in my periphery, I saw the undulation of the creature's spine as it kept pace with my car. But now it was slipping away, steering farther and farther from the road. It suddenly hit me just how hard my heart was beating. Beads of sweat dripped down my face. I looked over. The creature was gone. But this time, the feeling of dread had also gone with it. My stereo once again turned back on, and as my music resumed, I breathed a deep sigh of relief. I let off the accelerator. The man, the creature, whatever it was, it was finally gone for good. Having white-knuckled the steering wheel the whole time without realizing it, my hands were extremely sore. But I was glad to have made it through. A week later, I told another soldier in my unit about what I had experienced. Being originally from Albuquerque, she was familiar with the Native American legends of the Southwest. The conversation steered toward a certain creature that she would not dare speak the name of. She also told me that the highway I took was well known for all sorts of paranormal phenomena. Search what Route 491 used to be called, and everything will make sense. Be careful out there. I live in the UK and have family in a small town that is about a 20-minute drive from where I am. The family that lives in said town is my dad's first wife, 
my half-brother, and their families, and we all get along rather well and visit them quite often, when not in our current isolation. One evening, while driving through some rather heavy fog, I'm driving along the main road that connects the two towns, a road I know pretty well. I can see the rear of a large, dark-colored, blue or black, van about 100 to 200 feet ahead with its fog lights illuminated, and all seems fine, there is nothing behind me and nothing ahead of the van. I'm following said van for approximately 3 to 4 miles when we come to a rather heavily wooded section around some rather tight corners. All of a sudden the fog became thicker, which isn't unusual along this stretch, however, I noticed the van ahead had slowed down, so I brought my speed down to match and continued following the van around the next corner. At this point, the van in front bounces up the curb on the outside of the corner and heads towards a number of trees. Just as the van is about to hit the trees, it just disappears into the fog and vanishes. This is where it hits me rather quickly as I'm driving along. I have two half-brothers, one of whom is still living, and the other passed away in a road accident between my hometown and the town my family lives in in a van crash about 12 years ago. I later found out the spot where the van I saw going off the road was the exact spot my half-brother left the road and was killed instantly when his van collided with the tree, he wasn't wearing a seatbelt, which was very much out of the ordinary for him. And the color of the van he was driving was a very dark blue. I believe I watched a replay of his final moments on his way home from work that evening. It has one more twist. As I was driving along the brow of a hill, a few corners along the road, a rather large deer stood in the middle of the road. Maybe my half-brother slowing down was preparing me for said deer. I've driven along the same road many times since and haven't seen anything out of the ordinary since, even under heavy fog conditions. So we were driving into town earlier today to go to the bank holiday fair my town holds every year when my brother told my mom and me what happened to him last night. My brother lives in Cork, we live about a 7 hour drive away, with stops like, near the border. So, he comes up every now and again to spend a few days working from home. We have a dog. So when my brother is staying, he'll spend as much time with him as he can, for very long hikes, etc. It was half 9 at night, and my brother decided he was going to take the dog out of the forest, I know, crazy. So he was driving for maybe 3 to 4 minutes when his car conked out. It's never done this before. That's weird, he thinks as he goes to start the car again. But before he can, a woman's voice comes on the radio, the car still dead bare in mind, no address, no address. The car doesn't have a sat-nav, his phone was on silent, so it was creepy, to say the least. He starts the car and heads off on his hike. I ended up getting back at half 11. Madness. Anyway, so he told us today about it and told us he was a bit shaken up. And he's not one to get easily scared. Can anyone tell us if it was like aliens or something? I'm not completely opposed to the idea. It's just weird that the radio switched off and came on again while the car was still off. Plus, my brother listens to classical music in the car where there are no words. Driving home from a cousin's who decided to host Thanksgiving that year, out of the blue, my mom suggests driving around a bit to look at the Christmas lights already up. When I make this one left turn, a car turning right ends up right behind me. I turn onto a side street, knowing that the community is good for early displays. The car turns too. Nothing weird yet. The streets are laid out kind of like a grill, so I drive to the far right street and plan to wind my way up and down the streets until I get to the other end. The other car is still behind me. I've had coincidences before where I've actually trailed a car for several blocks, so I'm still thinking we just happen to be heading in the same direction. However, when I get to the end of the first street and they haven't turned into a driveway. I'm starting to get nervous, as is my mom. Desperately hoping it's nothing, she suggests that maybe they're looking at lights too. So, I deliberately turn up a street that has zero lights up yet, and the car follows me still. Now, I'm in a cold panic. I start making my way out of the neighborhood, but there's no direct exit. At one point I make a turn, and the car doesn't follow, and we're thinking they've given up, but then they suddenly turn onto the street I'm now on from a different connector street. Basically, I went straight, then left, and they went left, then straight. So, they're behind me again. My mom suggests driving to the nearest police station, but I do a quick count of how many stop signs and signals there are between us and the police station, and I'm worried they might try something at one of the stops. I then remember that my best friend from high school's parents live just a few blocks over from where I'm at, so I decide to head over there. The car manages to keep up with us, even when I get onto a main road, although not as close. I turn onto the street BFF's parents live on and pull right into their driveway. The dad comes out, he had this intimidating biker persona going on, wondering who the hell just pulled in his driveway. I quickly remind him of who I am and explain the situation. 
he immediately switches into protective mode. Just then, the car comes around the bend in the street, but when they see us in the driveway and biker dad standing there, they whip a U-turn and gun it out of there. He tells us to just sit tight for a while before heading home, and if they reappear and start following us again, just come on back, and he'll take care of them for us. Thankfully, they didn't, but to this day, it's got me paranoid every time a car is tailing us for any extended length of time. My two sisters, my best friend, and I were driving up through the redwoods in California from a trip we took. I was about 13 at the time, and we were heading back to our home in Oregon. It was late at night, about 10 or 11 p.m. The first thing that happened was that my friends and my CD players went out nearly at the same time. It scared us both awake, and we bolted right up, asking where we were. The radio was off, and we were driving pretty fast in the truck, my oldest sister was driving. She said we were going through the forest and that it may take a few hours before we get to the next hotel to try to sleep, but I could hear the nervousness in her voice. It was dead quiet out there and spooky, even though we were inside the truck. We drove a long time in silence with this feel of dread over us, and I remember all I wanted was to be at home. I kept watching the trees, expecting to see something, and often felt something breathing down my neck. We were all scared, all four of us, and it didn't leave until we got to the hotel. I am very curious about this experience, and later I had an experience that made me completely believe in monsters, along with other weird happenings in my childhood. Has anyone been through the redwoods during the day or night and felt the same thing? Or even saw something? I would love to hear about them. What I'm about to tell you is 100% true. There's a back road in Pennsylvania nicknamed Devil's Road, but it was formerly known as Cossert Road. You can search this road and read about its paranormal history. M. Night Shyamalan even filmed the village here. To give a brief summary, the DuPont family owned a mansion on Cossert Road years ago. It was nicknamed the Cult House because of strange activities that occurred on the property, including reported black magic and neighbors hearing unexplained demonic voices in the surrounding woods. Locals have even said that the DuPont family married their cousins to ensure that their wealth would stay in the family. Like any typical teen, I wanted to investigate the legends surrounding this creepy road. It was the Saturday before Halloween in 2011 that my friends and I decided to take a drive out to Cossert Road. It was around 10 p.m. when we arrived there, a completely dark and wooded area with no houses in sight. My two friends and I drove down the back road all alone, taking notice of the many trees that were sprayed with graffiti. About five minutes later, we arrived at the cult house. I told my friend to park the car on the side of the road so we could get a better look at the mansion. We stepped out and noticed a large gate with a metal fence that surrounded the entire front property. There was a long driveway behind the gate that continued uphill towards the mansion. We could barely see the house because of the trees that lined the driveway, blocking our view. My friend then pointed to the right of the house and told us to look at the large bonfire in the woods. I peered over in the direction that he was pointing and noticed 8 to 10 people surrounding the fire. What became very peculiar to me was the fact that these people were all dressed in red hooded outfits. I then realized that this must have been some kind of cult gathering. My friends and I were in complete shock at what we were witnessing. A few minutes later, we began hearing vehicles approaching us from the surrounding cornfields. My friends and I ran to the car and jumped inside. I turned around in the passenger seat and witnessed two black SUVs appear out of the cornfields and onto the road. I could see each driver wearing the same red hood but was unable to make out any facial features. I told my buddy to start the car and go as fast as possible, as this was a threatening situation. We took off and approached 50 miles per hour on the windy back road, but could find no relief as the SUVs were right behind us. Their high beams blinded our sight as we made our way through the wooded back roads, the one SUV went into the other lane and sped up to pass us. Now in front, the SUV put his brakes on to force us to stop. My friend panicked and decided to switch lanes and speed up to avoid the driver. Driving in the opposite lane, we were able to escape both drivers. I looked in the mirror to see that they were slowing down and becoming distant. The road was coming to an end, but we had no intention of slowing down. My buddy stopped at the last second and turned left onto a new back road. I turned around and could see that each SUV had stopped at the end of the road. They turned off their headlights and sat there, blocking us from entering Cossard. We just kept driving until we reached the main highway. That confrontation left us speechless, as we couldn't find the words to describe the fear we were experiencing. To this day, I will not return to Devil's Road. Once every few years, all throughout my life, I'm currently 27, something strange and inexplicable always seems to occur when I least expect it. This particular experience dates back about five years and took place on a back road in the Appalachian Mountains of Western North Carolina. It was sometime after dark, 
and my ex and I were driving back to the town we lived in at the time, located a couple hours north of Asheville, after visiting family there for the weekend. It was a clear summer night, and there was very little traffic on this country road. The weather was nice, and we had the windows down to feel the breeze. We weren't saying much, just listening to some music, a podcast, or something. After seeing no one else for at least 10 to 15 minutes, we rounded the corner onto a long straightaway stretch of road about a mile long that's visible to the next curve in the road. As we rounded the bend, another car's headlights could be seen rounding the opposite corner, coming in our direction with the high beams on. While most drivers tend to dim their lights when approaching oncoming traffic, this one did not. This prompted me to flash my lights to try and remind them their lights were on, which I tried multiple times to no avail. At this point, my ex and I were a bit flustered and were commenting on how obnoxiously powerful some cars' headlights can be sometimes, just ready to pass this person. Just as we came within about 10 yards of passing each other, the oncoming lights shut off completely, and there was nothing there. No car could be seen. Nothing was heard whooshing past us as we passed by with the windows down. No taillights were seen in the rear view mirror. Both my ex and I went rigid, and our hair stood on end. She just solemnly cut off the stereo, and we sat in silence for what felt like forever before verifying that the other person had seen it too and trying to make sense of it. I had little doubt about the paranormal at this point in my life, but my ex was much more skeptical, even after this happened, albeit less than she'd been prior. Nothing much out of the ordinary seemed to result from this encounter, at least not that I could directly attribute to it, but it's a vivid memory I think of often. The cold road is a completely true story. This incident happened in real life, and though we experienced fear in that dreadful event, many people there claim it's all a lie. Nothing like that happens, and such things only exist in stories. Perhaps I used to think the same way, but now I believe that something like this does happen, which scares many people. I went to the cinema with friends. We watched a show from 9 to 12, and all our friends came out of the cinema together. That's when one of my friends said, Hey, look, the fog has come down so much that nothing is visible. It was December, and the cold was very intense. As soon as we left the cinema, my teeth started clattering. The cold was so severe that visibility was reduced to just 10 steps. I said, hey, now we'll have to ride the bike at the speed of a tortoise. Look, nothing is really visible. So, how will we reach home on time? Friends replied, no worries, we have to go home anyway, and besides, let's not wait for the fog to clear here. Let's go. After that, we all started our bikes, and from there, we moved towards home together. We hadn't gone far when one friend said, hey, the road is completely empty. No one is stopping us. Why not have a race and see who reaches the neighborhood first? Upon hearing this, the rest of the friends said, okay, let's see today who has the courage. Why are you doing a job that leads to death? Nothing is visible even 10 steps ahead, and you guys are talking about a race. I said, hey, it's not like that. Due to the fog, visibility is low so how can we race like this? Don't you think we should be very cautious at this time? That's why my other friend said, hey, we all love races. Let it come slowly. Besides, when we go in front of it at the speed of lightning, I'm sure all his precautionary advice will be forgotten, and he'll fly the bike like the wind. Because that's his way of teasing whenever someone overtakes him. So, he automatically starts a race with them and goes ahead. Only a few people know about it, right? He's just playing drama and nothing else. In the meantime, another friend said, come on, let's start then. 3, 2, 1, go. Saying this, everyone increased the speed of their bikes, and in no time, they disappeared in the fog. I was wearing a thin jacket, and I didn't even have gloves on my hands. As a result, my hands became extremely cold. Due to the intense cold, I was shivering a lot. The entire road was deserted, and I was walking alone on the road like a madman. Now, I was feeling very cold, so I kept the speed of my bike slow because my whole body was trembling due to the cold. The road was empty again after some time. I was silently walking, and there was such silence that I could only hear the sound of my bike, I couldn't hear anyone else's sound. I continued walking and reached a turn where there was a shortcut. The name of this shortcut was Cold Road, and this is the new name of this road, whereas this road was famous by the name of Bamboo Road at that time. Because on both sides of this road, there were big bamboo trees. Both sides of the road were covered with trees, as if someone had put a roof of bamboo on this road. I thought that if I took the road with bamboo trees, I would quickly reach my friends because my friends would go straight to Dharampura through Mall Road. I will reach them. But along with this, I was also a little scared because this road was already infamous for strange and unusual incidents. 
I had heard about this road from many people. They said that this road has a lot of spooky things. It was also said that whoever passes through this road after 7 p.m., strange things happen to them. Many people didn't even pass through this road during the day because they were scared. Because both sides of this road had no settlement, only some jungle-like shrubs and bamboo trees. Some distance away, there was an old college on the side, and the way to go to the college was also on the side of the canal. Meaning only the wall of the college behind this road was there. And after 7 p.m., no one passed through here. Whereas I was standing on this road around 12.38 at night. Then I thought, man, I'm already scared like this. People just believe in such rumors. While near me, these are just rumors. Thinking about this, I started walking on this road and gradually started riding the bike. The fog on this road was even more intense. Only the bike's light provided a little visibility. I had just gone a little distance when I felt that someone in white clothes was standing on the left side of the road. But I couldn't clearly see it. I reduced the speed of my bike and moved a bit forward. When I turned on the bike's light to put on my raincoat, I saw a beautiful woman standing on the left side of the road. She was dressed in a charming white outfit with long, flowing black hair left open. Her face was attractive and beautiful, adorned with lots of jewelry, giving the impression that she belonged to a wealthy family. I thought to myself, it's 1 AM, what is this woman doing here? She might be involved in some shady activities or could be collaborating with robbers to loot people pretending to offer lifts. I accelerated my bike even more and cautiously approached her. When the distance between us was only 10 steps, I veered my bike to the right side of the road and stopped, while she remained on the left. I thought that if anything went wrong, I could easily escape. I asked her loudly, who are you, and what are you doing here? However, she didn't respond. I thought she might not have heard me, so I approached a bit closer and asked again. Still, there was no reply. Now, I was getting nervous, considering the possibility of her being involved in some criminal activity. As I was contemplating whether to leave or insist on an answer, she suddenly burst into tears and said, I am in big trouble. I was returning from a family function with my husband and relatives when our bike got a flat tire. We were walking, and my husband went to fix the puncture. He hasn't returned yet, and I am scared of being alone in this deserted place. Her words stirred compassion in my heart. I suggested, if you're comfortable, you can sit on my bike, and I'll take you to your husband. We can look for help together, she agreed, and we started riding in the direction she pointed. Despite the tension at first, the situation started to feel better. I thought, maybe she could become a good friend. I decided to engage in a conversation, telling her about myself and asking about her life. However, she remained silent, ignoring my attempts to initiate a conversation. Feeling somewhat rejected, I continued to ride in silence. After a while, I thought maybe she was just not interested in talking, and the idea of her being arrogant started bothering me. As these thoughts consumed me, she suddenly spoke in an angry tone, stay quiet and keep moving forward, or you'll regret it. Startled and afraid, I realized I had misjudged the situation. The road seemed endless, and although I was pushing the bike to its limit, it felt as if an unseen force was holding it back. Fear enveloped me, and I realized that I couldn't escape this mysterious and potentially dangerous encounter. The voice of someone loudly breathing behind me began to be heard. It was as if someone was forcefully inhaling near my ears. Goosebumps started to appear on my skin, and in that moment, I realized that it wasn't a person with me but rather something else. Suddenly, a hand was placed on my shoulder, and a wave of fear ran through my entire body. Trembling, I turned to look at my shoulder and saw a strange, black hand with large, nail-studded fingers. The hand slowly moved towards my neck, and a chilling laughter emanated from behind me. The laughter was so intense that it drowned out the sound of my bike, which seemed to have gotten stuck in one place while its tires were still spinning. At the same time, someone placed their mouth on my other shoulder. Terrified, I looked back and saw a terrifying figure sitting behind me. The figure was completely black, but it had large, bright white eyes that shone like lights in the night. It had its hand placed on my neck. On the other hand, it was holding onto a tree that was quite far away. Perhaps that's why the bike wasn't moving forward. Seeing all this, my entire body became as cold as ice. In a louder voice, I started reciting a prayer, and at that moment, a horrifying scream came from behind me. Trembling, I looked back, and there was a very monstrous looking woman sitting there. Her appearance was entirely black, but her eyes were big and bright white, shining like lights. She had placed one hand on my neck. The other hand was gripping a tree, and the bike wasn't moving. Witnessing this, my entire body turned cold like snow. I continued reciting the prayer in a louder voice, and she released my neck. I quickly recited the prayer, and the bike, 
freed from her grasp, suddenly accelerated and went ahead at full speed. I didn't look back and, without stopping, reached the village in about five minutes. Without delay, I went home. I have no idea how far that thing has chased me. All I know is that on that day, I immediately got a high fever, and after that day, I never made fun of anyone again because I realized that supernatural things exist everywhere and one should never forget them. I am now a 26-year-old male, but the story happened when I was 18 years old in the autumn of 2015, and I thought it finally had to be my turn to share a scary story. I was driving home through the woods after I'd been over at my friend's house. It was a dark, cold, and stormy November night. I drove fully concentrated since I had just gotten my driver's license with no music and my phone in my pocket. Suddenly I see a big tree log blocking the road, and I'm like, WTF. I had just started working out, so I figured I might just move it myself. When I got out of my car, another car appeared from behind. I don't think much of it, hence, it is the most direct road from my town to my friend's town, so I just keep moving on. As I begin moving the log, the car, which of course gets closer and closer, starts flickering the lights and honking. I just got my driver's license, and I am very unexperienced in traffic, so I get stressed out and run into my car, quickly speeding up. The car behind me keeps honking and flickering. I can't see the driver, and I don't recognize the car, so I drive some rounds in my neighborhood to shake it off, but the car keeps following. I finally decided to head home. When I get to the driveway, I stop the car, run into my house, and lock the door. Just as I've locked the door, someone knocks on it. I got the chills, and since I'm already completely freaked out from the drive, I just ran into my room to hide. The knocking keeps on going and gets more determined. All of a sudden, I can hear a woman calling my surname. I get even more anxious, but I figure out what it says on my mailbox. Her voice is very calm, and after she has called me for a minute or two, I decide to approach the door and look through the door eye. I see an older couple who appear very kind. My heartbeat slows down, and I take a deep breath before I open the door. The woman says, Oh, thank the Lord, you open the door. We were nervous for your well-being. The man elaborates as he sees my wondering face. When you were out moving the big log from the road, we saw a man crawl inside the backseat of your car. My guts start turning inside me, and I get even more anxious than I was before, but I instinctively grab an umbrella by the door and run towards my car. I look through the windows, but I can't see anyone, so I open the door, and under the driver's seat, I find a small pocket knife that doesn't belong to me. I lived in Palm Coast, Florida, for most of my young life until I was 21 and moved up north. At the time, Palm Coast and Flagler Beach were developed with mostly separated large housing additions full of streets that all connected to one another, beginning with the same letter. As teenagers driving around, each friend lived in a different section, and we would specify the different developments as the W section, the R section, and so on. It has become more populated over time, so I'm sure a lot of areas have changed, as far as my memory serves. Outside the areas of the Palm Coast that were developed, it was mostly wooded areas with long winding roads that went on for miles into the swampy areas of the Halifax River. They would eventually end up in another town, such as Ormond or Daytona Beach, if you drove long enough. But nothing in between for a good 45 minutes, at least except dense tree canopies, random side roads, and the swamp. If you followed Old Dixie Highway, which was equally isolated, you would eventually find your way to our favorite road to take at night for long drives. Old Dixie Highway. A decent-sized group of us, either in one or two cars depending on how many went, would drive down the highway and side roads leading nowhere while blaring music, chain-smoking, shit-talking, and otherwise being normal bored teenagers just trying to have some freedom outside of high school and our part-time jobs. Recently, we heard about the ruins of an old house that was supposedly haunted by the angry spirit of the woman who had been killed there. A witch, so to speak. She was killed by a small mob after she was suspected of killing animals and abducting a handful of missing children. Her house was then vandalized as well as set on fire. The story went on to say that a group of campers stumbled upon it in the early 90s and set up camp. Their belongings and equipment were found days later by a hunter. Torn sleeping bags, broken lanterns, and clothes everywhere. The entire group was gone. No explanation. On the remaining walls and brick fireplace was graffiti, including satanic symbols. Being the no-fear type of kids we were, naturally we set out around midnight on a Friday to find this place with only our knowledge of the roads and curves themselves that were told to us in the story. The story said there would be a set of brick pillar markers hidden in the brush that was the entrance to the property. We followed the winding road into the night, full of excitement. This night, we took two cars, there were four in one, 
and myself and my friend Jessica were in her brand new 2004 Royal Blue Mustang. I was excited for her and wanted to take this beast out for a spin with her. We came to the large curve in the road where we were told the markers would be. We slowed down and parked on the right side of the road, hoping we had enough room between the water and the side of the road to not sink or be sideswiped if someone came speeding by. Under a huge dead tree, we exited our vehicles. One flashlight, and no shortage of nervousness and excitement. The sky was black, and we could hear the cries of animals in the distance. Our footsteps echoed as they hit the blacktop. Moss hung everywhere from the large trees that almost covered the area with a canopy of leaves. We made it to a small opening in the trees, and I pointed out the nearly demolished markers. The wind picked up and rustled the trees and bushes around us. This was it. The six of us bent back the brush and started to make our way down the path to the old ruins. We were scared at this point and in complete darkness, aside from one flashlight that my friend Jeff had while he was leading the pack and a few burning cigarettes in our anxious fingers. The path seemed to get more and more narrow and overgrown as we continued on. A few minutes later, we could see in the distance the brick fireplace that was still standing, along with what seemed to be half a brick wall and files of rocks and rubble. I could see faded images drawn on some areas in red, but it was not completely clear what they were. The air changed. Everything went still the closer we got. No wind, no sounds. And we were all silent. I stopped in my tracks and peered into the darkness around me. This wasn't right. This wasn't right at all. Jessica stopped with me and asked me if I was okay. Jeff went ahead, with the others following behind him. I was frozen. Something was there. And it wasn't happy that we were. Within a minute, I heard a shriek unlike anything I had ever heard before in my life. It was not one of us. The wind picked up, and the branches swayed heavily. Angrily. And the sound echoed around us. Out of nowhere, I see the flashlight bouncing on the ground, followed by the screams of Jeff and my other three friends. They barreled past us, screaming, Go! Go! The flashlight left where it was. Another shriek from the distance. I gathered myself and took off running with Jessica until we made it back to the brick markers. We dispersed onto the road in a state of panic, not really sure what had happened. One of the other girls was crying and raced back to the cars. I turned to look toward the area we had just fled from. It wasn't done. My blood ran cold. The wind picked up. Something was watching us. I could feel it, as if I could actually see it coming out from behind the trees. I took off, running for the Mustang with Jessica in tow. The others had loaded up into the car behind us and started it. We jumped inside and shut the doors. Locking them out of instinct. I still felt it, right outside the car, watching us. Jessica put her keys in the ignition and started it. Nothing. The car behind us was pulling away and retreating back down the road the way we came. The Mustang sat in silence. She fired it up again. Nothing. Not even the lights flickered, but the engine kicked and jerked but would not fire. My gaze was set directly in front of me outside in the dark. I could barely see the old tree we had parked in front of. The hairs on the back of my neck were straight up. This was a warning. This was no game. The fear was real. And whatever it wanted us to know, we were not welcome there again. I was shaking, and Jessica was screaming at her car to fire up. Suddenly, we got still for a moment, in shock at what was happening. We looked at each other and heard what sounded like a branch being drugged across her driver's side door. And then, with that, the feeling in the air changed again. It became almost lighter within an instant, she fired up her car, and it started on command. We backed up into the road and made a U-turn to head back up Old Dixie Highway. We could see headlights in the distance. Jeff had come back when they realized we weren't behind him. We made our way around the curve and followed the other car home at a slower than normal pace. We smoked silently, just glancing at one another once in a while, like, what the duck just happened? We made it back to Palm Coast and stopped at a gas station for some coffee. Jeff never said what he saw back there. And we never told the others exactly what had happened to us in the car. Jessica did have a long scratch on her door. But it wasn't very deep. She told everyone that she parked too close to a large bush at some point. We never really talked about it again. We still took weekend night drives here and there, but never went super late at night or in less than a group of three. And we never stopped in that area of Old Dixie again. My friend and I were driving down a bunch of rural roads into the mountains one night. We were on our way to a campsite, but we were running late and got lost a few times, so it was really late at night. We hadn't passed anyone else on the opposite side for a good 45 minutes or so. The roads were really dark, of course, there were no street lights or anything. Then some huge truck was suddenly behind us. He was right on our tail for miles and miles. It didn't matter how fast we went, he was right there behind us. 
We traveled up mountains, down valleys, and through tunnels and passed quite a few turnoffs, but this guy kept right up with us. Here we are, two girls in our early 20s with no real sense of where we are, just that this road somehow was supposed to lead to this campsite, and this huge hick truck is barreling after us. Finally, we reach the camp, and there's quite a few cars and trailers. You could see a few campfires flickering in the woods, so we knew people were still up. We get to the pull-up window, and my friend, who was the driver, starts giving her information to the lady, and I twist around in my seat to see the truck is gone. What a huge relief that was. One of the scariest nights of my life, that's for sure. I've always had creepy paranormal experiences, but when I'm with my sister, 25F, the dial goes up to 10 on the creep factor. So anyway, a couple of months ago, my sister and I had to drive up to Colorado for a family emergency. Specifically, we were driving to Dillon, Colorado. The drive up was pretty normal, and nothing weird started to happen until we got right outside of Leadville. That's when things took a turn for the decidedly strange. You can believe me or not about what I'm about to say, but even though it was late at night, I know I'm not crazy, and my sister saw all of this too. So, we're driving, and it's pitch black outside. There are very few street lamps, so the only things we can see are illuminated by the headlights. My sister is driving, and I'm in the passenger seat. At this point in the drive, we had only a few more hours until Dylan, and we were determined to stick it out no matter what, despite the fact we'd been driving for nearly 12 hours at this point. Looking back, I kind of wish we'd had some common sense, found a hotel, and never driven on this road at this time of night. It's about 9. My sister has the radio going. I'm staring out the window, trying to stay awake, when all of a sudden my sister slams on her brakes. Now, for context, my sister is a cabbie, there's not a whole hell of a lot that would make her slam on the brakes like that. So when she did, I was automatically on full alert, wondering what the hell just happened. Before I can even ask her what made her slam on the brakes, she's telling me to look up. No shit, standing in the middle of the opposite lane on this deserted two-lane road is a big as duck coyote. It's bigger than any coyote I've ever seen. Not that unusual. Except that it was just staring at us, not the car, at us. It was making full-on, dead-ass eye contact with us. Obviously creeped out I told my sister to just floor it because I didn't like the eerie, almost intelligent way that Coyote had been looking at us. As we passed it, I forced my eyes forward so I wouldn't have to look at it. We kept driving, a little shaken up but laughing it off. After all, we're both from the southwest, and there's no way a lone Coyote is going to spook us that badly. A little bit further down the road, I'm calmed down again and back to staring out the window. Maybe five more minutes pass before I hear my sister ask me, did you see that? Thinking she's messing with me, I'm like, no, see what? As I turn to look at her, I can see she's spooked. Believe me, it takes a lot to spook her, so I was immediately concerned. She sees that I have no clue what she's talking about, so she says, dude, there was a hand, it just came up out of the back seat and touched the dash. Now I'm even more creeped out. I try to make a joke out of it, saying how it's late and the whole thing with the coyote. But she's insistent on what she saw. So I asked her to replicate it. She gestures to the back seat and says, I saw a hand come up and touch the dash like this. At this she makes a fist and taps it against the dash. I shake my head and tell her I didn't see anything. We should just keep going, because I sure as hell am not turning back now. But, oh man, that was not the end of it. Not even 10 minutes later, we're still driving on this dark, windy mountain road. I'm looking forward, fully awake now, and doing my best to take my mind off the situation when I happened to glance out the driver's side of the front windshield. Again, on the opposite side of the road, I see a woman standing on the edge of the road. She's all alone and just standing there in a torn white dress, barefoot. Obviously thinking that this girl needs help, I open my mouth to ask my sister to stop. Before I can get the words out, we're already around the next bend, and as I look in the rear view mirror to check if she's still there, the girl is just gone. Vanished. Poof. I'm really freaking out at this point, and I just want to get to our hotel. Thankfully, a few minutes later, we were in Leadville itself. Which, TBH, at around 10-11 at night was just as creepy, if not more. I dreaded when we got to the outskirts of town and had to go back onto that lonely mountain highway. Mind you, we're still alone. We haven't seen another car in over an hour. Which makes this next part even creepier somehow. So, a few miles on the other side of Leadville, I feel my sister grab my arm. Again, she asks the dreaded question, did you see that? I say no, obviously. I'm keeping my eyes on the side of the vehicle, and I have no idea what she's talking about. So she says, and honestly, 
after what happened after this, I completely believe her, that she saw breath on the outside of the windshield. Not the inside, but the outside. Like someone outside the vehicle had breathed on the glass. I'm really glad that I didn't see that, because I would have turned the car around. But at this point, we're both like, duck it, we're almost there, and we can hold out until Dylan. So, like dumb idiots in a horror movie, we kept driving. I don't know how far away this is from Leadville, but we came up to a weird parking lot area at a bend in the road. I think it was a hotel or something. I'm not too familiar with the area, but it was weird seeing a parking lot and actual lights in the middle of BFE Colorado. I'm saying this to tell you that as we approached this place, we saw oncoming headlights. Now, mind you, this was the first car we'd seen in a long time, but if there was this weird lit up building out there and Leadville only a few miles behind us, it wouldn't be that strange to see a car heading the other direction. Except, the car didn't go in the direction we thought. No, we both saw the lights of this car, and we both saw it drive parallel to the road and disappear. Now we're for sure thinking we're hallucinating and making jokes about aliens. Saying how that was a flying saucer, and we could tally that to the list of weird things we'd seen. With not many options left but to drive, we keep going. But man, that's when things started getting really bad. The longer we're driving, the more freaked out my sister looks. At one point, she tells me that the lane lines are disappearing. As in, she can't tell the difference between one lane line and the other. On a two-lane mountain road. You can blame this on fatigue, but my sister drives a cab for a living. She wakes up at 2 a.m. to go to work most days. There's no freaking way, no matter how tired she is, that she's hallucinating the lane lines not being there. I can see them just fine, but she swears up and down that she can't see lanes on either side. I think it was only her experience as a cab driver that saved our asses. Now this next part is going to sound insane, and I don't blame anyone for not believing me. I wouldn't believe me if I didn't experience it myself. So, we got the lane lines disappearing, cars disappearing off the road, weird shit breathing on the windshield, and the icing on this cake is that now it feels like the car is doing a free fall down the mountain. No, it's not like we're out of control. There's an invisible force pushing us from behind and trying to make us go down the mountain faster. My sister is riding the brakes like hell, and I'm trying to figure out why it feels like we're in free fall when we're on a less than 20 degree slope. It makes no sense. And as I'm thinking this, I hear my sister ask me, hey, is it windy outside? I shake my head, check my phone, and am like, no, there's no wind outside at all. In the car, you would have been able to hear the wind and feel it pushing on all sides, not just the back. The wind makes a very distinctive noise, so I know that there wasn't any wind that night. That doesn't explain, however, why, when my sister told me to look at the trees on either side of the road, they were swaying. Bending back and forth like there's a storm outside. But there's no storm. There's no wind. No clouds. Nothing. There is nothing that could explain why these trees are moving like this. I'm really freaked out now, and I start to pray. I'm religious to a point, and I'm not ashamed to say that I pray when I get scared like this, and I was terrified. Because underneath all of the crazy, this strange, eerie feeling was creeping up on me. It felt like there was something in the woods watching us. The trees felt almost alive, and there was just darkness. I don't know how else to explain it, it was just evil. It felt evil and wrong, and I just did not want to be there anymore. I started praying harder and told my sister to drive as fast as she could away from that place, which, to be honest, with everything going on, wasn't that fast. For some reason, I just keep repeating that there's something bad here, something bad happened here, and I don't like it. Saying that over and over again. So, of course, my sister asks, what do I mean, and why do I keep saying that? Now, I'm not sure if I'm a medium, but I would consider myself sensitive. I can pick up on the energy of spirits and places. So, like a dumbass, I open myself up to whatever the duck this thing is. I can hear my sister asking me what happened. And the word that came out of my mouth, in an inhuman guttural growl, was murder. That voice was not my voice. That thing was not human. As soon as that word left my mouth, I burst into tears. I was so scared. I clutched my merry medallion, and I held my sister's hand. I made her pray the prayer of Saint Michael with me. And when we were praying, it was almost like she couldn't get the words out. Like, Ike, something was trying to stop her from praying. I haven't been that scared of something paranormal in a very long time, and I never, ever want to drive that stretch of road at night again. Could we have been hallucinating? Sure. But, Ike, this next part somehow creeps me out even more. So, we're at the hotel now, and we're in our room. Both were talking about how crazy that all was. 
my sister says you didn't see it, did you? And of course, I'm like, see what, she tells me, and I believe her because she was dead serious. My sister can't lie if her life depended upon it because she just starts laughing, it's her fault. That's how I knew she at least believed what she saw. She told me that she saw a skeletal figure, like a human figure, in the woods. It was all bone with, like, rotten flesh hanging off it. Even though its body was human, she said that it had the head of a deer and, like, glowing red eyes. She looked so scared, I don't know how I couldn't have believed her. According to my sister, she saw this thing tailing the car the moment we both noticed the trees moving, so about halfway or a third of the way down? Needless to say, I was pretty glad that she told me that after we got to the hotel. Now, one last thing before I wrap this up. So, my stepmom is from the Denver area and just so happened to have family in Dillon. I casually asked her if she'd ever experienced anything weird on that road, and I didn't even have to tell her which one for her to know the road I was talking about. She said when she was a kid, it used to freak the hell out of her. She can remember falling asleep in the car and then, whenever they got to that stretch of road, automatically waking up because she was too scared to sleep. And the thing about the car driving parallel to the road? Well, my stepmother said, and I haven't confirmed this, so take this with a grain of salt. The roads used to be built differently back in the day. They would have run parallel to the mountain and not alongside it. She also told me a story from when she was a teenager about how there was a time she and her dad were driving on the road at night. She's in the passenger seat for context. She remembers looking up and seeing oncoming headlights in their lane, screaming, and then throwing her hands up out of reflex. Her dad swerves, almost crashes, and then asks her what's wrong. My stepmom, confused, asks him if he saw that car just now, and he says no, of course. TBH, that just confirmed it for me. Oh, and the whole thing about that weird voice? My sister said that when I spoke in that tone, it was about two octaves deeper than my natural voice, completely flat, and absolutely not human. Me and my sister both agree that whatever that entity was that she saw was absolutely trying to harm, if not kill, us. We both think that it was screwing with her about the lane lines and trying to push us off the mountain. For what purpose, I still don't know, but I honestly don't think I want to. We also agreed that all the freaky SHT we saw before was something trying to warn us. The primary reason? That hand with a fist in sign language can mean stop. I think it's possible those other entities were trying to tell us to turn around. Too bad we didn't listen. But anyway, that's my story of a possible encounter with a Wendigo and other things that go bump in the night. I never have and never will again drive the road between Leadville and Dillon at night or any other time. So I'm just curious. Has anyone else had an experience like this there? Or an experience like this in general? <laughs>